Okay, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. And uh, in, the, in the spirit of uh, the open government that, uh, that we try to have in the town of Peru, and I'm sure Blackstone has too, we're uh, recording this to, uh, to post on YouTube for anyone who missed it and wanted, wants to uh, uh, go back and uh, observe and, and learn a little bit and uh, give themselves a uh, refresher. Uh, so we're thank you everyone for coming. We're uh, we're joined tonight by uh, Maria Everett, uh, who is the executive director of the Virginia Freedom of Information Advisory Council, a legislative agency created in July 2000. Since its inception, the FOIA Council has rendered more than 18,500 informal opinions and more than 500 written opinions on the application and interpretation of the Freedom of Information Act. Maria is also a senior attorney with the Division of Legislative Services and serves as counsel to the House Committee on General Laws. She earned a BS degree from Virginia Tech and a JD uh, degree from George Mason University School of Law. So let's uh, welcome Maria. Thanks. Thank you for coming. Sure, my pleasure. Yeah, so I guess I'm going to have to stand up. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's okay, I've been in the car driving. Well, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It's beautiful down here. But then, so much of Virginia is beautiful. You know, it really, that's why I love this job. And I think as the FOIA Council, you know, our statutory duties are to publish educational materials and to do training and to write opinions. We do opinions like the AJ's office, formal written opinions that, that's what I was talking about, Alan putting off doing get track those things up but we also answer do opinions now that we've been around for 15 years um, that we respond to 1800 phone calls and emails a year and part of what I like to tell people when I'm talking is one is the Freedom of Information Act so I'm not sure if you do know where the caffeine in this building is, <laughs> you know. Um, but when I was speaking in Alexandria this morning at the Sanitation Authority, um, just a, kind of across the water from where I grew up, and it was like, oh, that's what that brick, you know, big chimney thing is. You know, you always saw it as a kid. Well, they knew where the caffeine was because a lot of people think, oh, geez, you're going to listen to the Freedom of Information Act or snooze. Um, but also, to please ask questions as they occur to you, secure in the knowledge there is no such thing as a stupid FOIA question. Um, like I said, we, Alan and I, <clears throat> I appreciate you saying my staff, you know, because it's basically Alan and I, and we're like co-captains. <laughs> and um, But we answered so many phone calls and emails, and we have yet to hang up the phone and go, oh my word, what an idiot. So I'm either throwing the gauntlet down to you to be the first people that can come up with a stupid FOIA question, you know, but I don't think it happens. So this is about perception versus reality, what this law actually requires. And so the Virginia Freedom of Information Act has two distinct parts, the Open Records Act part of it and the Open Meetings Law. And we're going to focus mainly on the meeting side, but we're going to talk about emails, that emails can clearly become public records, but can emails become public meetings? And, um, and the answer to that question is yes as well. And um, so Virginia has its own law. A lot of
at the same time we're the government. And so if it's truly our government, then we have the right to see what we're doing, what we've elected or appointed people to do on our behalf because the public is always the beneficiary of what happens at any level of government. And on the meeting side, like I said, the record side applies to everybody. Records, public record, we can go into that discussion is, you know, FOIA is a mandatory disclosure law, which says, absent an, um, an exemption in the law, you must give records out when they're requested. And um, on the meeting side, it just applies to deliberative bodies, you know, school boards, town councils, uh, boards of supervisors, even committees of the General Assembly. Um, I write the FOIA law, it comes to my committee, which is a fairly cool thing. I don't get up and say anything for or against bills because the people that will love or hate them are already in the audience, so I just draft them. Um, like I said, stinky bills get sent to the FOIA Council for a little more study. Um, we were talking about there was a bill this year that made both violations of FOIA a class one misdemeanor. I don't, you know, the idea is, hey, take it seriously. I'm all about that, but criminalizing administrative conduct is not a good idea. You know I mean, it's hard enough to get people to serve. And, you know, and I appreciate public officials serving because it's not, it is, you know, it's anything but, and my view is the only more thankless job in public service is being a board member on your homeowner association. You know, but basically this, you know, is anybody really here doing this for glory? No, you know, it's, it's really a thankless job before you even can get to the people's business. You have the Freedom of Information Act, you have the Conflict of Interest Act, you got record retention, you have all these things that steer you before you even utter the first word out of your mouth. So our learning modules for this evening, if you will, are what the heck is a meeting? How do we know when we're having a meeting? Um, because boy, is a procedural law. It's all about process. Um, there's not really any substance to it. And it's about being responsive in the record side of it. And the guarantee of this law policy on the meeting side is to grant every opportunity for the citizens to witness the operation of government. And because the idea is how you arrive at a decision is just as important as the decision you make. Um, and when I talk to citizen groups, I hammer them a lot with the responsibility of citizenship. You know, it's not enough to not go to meetings and not make FOIA requests and not know what's going on, but still rail against the government for things they did. You know, like, no. And this, you know, Jefferson said it best that you know, government works best with the consent of the government. And if we're our own governors, then we must arm ourselves with the knowledge that open government takes. So, first thing is what a meeting is. And a meeting is, and we recognize the first problem of what a meeting is. Anytime town council or the deliberative body, I just, I'll call it board, okay, for the lack of for economy of language. When you're at your regular meetings, sitting at a dais, Everybody recognizes that's a meeting, got that part. And so the procedural side of FOIA is, if it's a meeting, it requires three things. And FOIA is all about three things all the time. One, it requires notice. It requires it to be open to the public, and it requires minutes. And when you analyze what those procedural requirements are, your staff, out of those three things, does two out of the three. They do the notice, and they do the minutes. And all you have to do, and it seems to be a challenge for some, is to meet publicly. I tell every elected official, with all due respect, that nobody put a gun to anybody's head in this room and said, you must serve. You did this to yourself. And now you're on the most public stage of your life, and there's really no hiding place. And so that's what the meeting's law is about, is watching you. Now, one of the the myths about FOIA is that FOIA requires, you know, public comment. 
the Freedom of Information Act does not grant a right for public comment. Other laws do in Title 15.2, like if you're adopting a budget, you're zoning, lots of things require public hearings. But FOIA doesn't. FOIA is an eyes and ears kind of a, a law that you have, people can witness the operation of government so they're informed, but it does not give them rights to speak. And citizens are sort of shocked by that. Um, but you can, this is a law of minimum, so you can always do more. So if you want to afford a right to speak, you can. Um, you even can control how long they speak because FOIA is the balance against the right of access against the need of government to function. So as elected officials, and we'll talk, include you know, planning commission people and those kinds of appointed positions that serve on deliberative boards, you know, they have the right to control the proceeding for efficiency, you know, to make it work for everybody who's in the audience and at the dais. So back to what a meeting is. Then we get to the rule of three. Anytime three or more members of a single deliberative body, so it's the town council approved, the town council of Blackstone, anytime the members gather in sufficient number, which under the law is three, and discuss the public business of that body. So it requires both things, the right number, three or more, and the right discussion. Then it is a meeting under the law. It's like when you got elected without your knowledge, you got a tattoo across your forehead. And when these rule of three happens, your tattoo becomes visible and starts blinking. So my job, I said, I'm not the FOIA cops. You know, I'm not the FOIA police. I just try to charm everybody to do the right thing for the right reason. You know, because democracy is a messy business. You know, but it's still better than every other form of government. Um, so I want to examine the rule of three and the discussion. So again, right number and right conversation. Now people are going to see you, you know, even at the Hardee's, three or more, and they're going to automatically assume you're talking shop, public business. And probably they're right because that's, I mean, in smaller localities, you know each other on a different basis too, but in lots of localities, that's the basis of your relationship is your public business, so you default into talking shop. The FOIA says, no, you can't talk shop in a context of three or more. We call the two by two, we call that the Noah's Ark rule. Two by two, you can talk, members of the same public body, so can talk about public business without notice, without it being open to the public, and without minutes because, again, that balance access against the need of government to function. And the two by two rule is we want deliberative process to be ongoing. We don't want you to put your government hat on when you're sitting in a dais and doing things by the seat of your pants. But there's a limit under the law of how many people can do that. And so how many people on council? Seven in each town. Seven in each town. So That's three. Right. You're coming pretty close to a quorum. <laughs> and that's why the rule three, and that's why the General Assembly in 2005 changed, changed the rules so it doesn't apply to them, the rule of three. Because three out of 100 members of the House, or three out of the Senate, that's not momentum. You know? But in a smaller five, seven, nine, 12 members, three is starting to gain some momentum. How about mayor plus two council members? And Hardy's talking town business. I had this discussion with the mayor. Um, if the mayor is considered a member of council, then you have a meeting. If the mayor is not a member of council, you don't have a meeting. We're not. We're yeah, not. right. We've always, in Blackstone, we've always, even though I'm not a member of council, right. I've always pretend, I'd like to pretend I'm a member of council just to be safe. Right. That way, if people see me plus two members of council, Right. Let's avoid that because they're going to think they're talking shop. Right, Especially exactly. after meeting the jurors. That's when most folks get in trouble. Meeting the jurors, right. you're hanging around, you start dissecting the meeting. I'm like, folks, get it going. Go exactly, on. and you're right because so much of FOIA, you know, it's the law and it's procedural, but so much of it is public relations and its application. And, and, and that's great because you can always do more. So if you want to consider yourself for intent, all intents, first, we're not getting the mayor and two members of council, we're not going to do that without notice. You know? 
And so, and that's a good example of where three or more and the discussion, because let's just um, explore where that can happen. You come early to a meeting, you're talking to staff about what? The agenda. Yep. Beep, beep, beep. Mm -hmm. The notice, the meeting has been noticed for seven o'clock. You're here at six o'clock talking shop, three or more, and the discussion. As you noted, after meeting, post mortem, three or more. Yeah, we, out we've, the had door. Citizens, we've had citizens, uh, actually, two years ago, we had a member of council mm -hmm. who left the meeting with home, and it was a very, it was a very, uh, meeting full of uh, drama. They decided to go and stood at a band's play to watch, and they watched three members of council still in the chambers a good hour after the meeting. And it was a reasonable assumption to assume yes, well, they're not talking about the Cowboys Redskins game in September. They're talking yeah. about the meeting. That's right. And right. And and that's you know the public relations side of that and because ultimately transparency is about trust. And it's a two sided trust. You trust the citizens that they won't lose their minds when you talk about things. Though we know they take things we say and go to, right to the bank with it, you know. But it's also they can trust you. And the one reward about dogged adherence to the meetings rules is that you, you're boring. Because there is no story in compliance. I like to say compliance is never newsworthy. Show me one newspaper article that says, what a good job you're doing. Show me one, just one. So people, the media doesn't show up, citizens, when they can trust you. And that's not a bad reward, you know, that they do everything by the book, we can trust them. You know, it's, it's a good thing. So we have coming early, post more after the meeting is adjourned. You're still having a meeting, which is not noticed. And I wanna just talk about the enforcement side of the FOIA. So now you know there was a bill. Thank God it did not pass. It's in front of the FOIA Council. We we're meeting next week. We'll throw it into this. We're doing a three-year study about exemptions and everything because a lot of FOIA is out of date. But um, so what happens if you violate the law? And FOIA says specifically, a failure to follow any procedure is deemed a violation. So no notice is given have a violation. There are no minutes taken. You have a violation. And so somebody can sue you on that basis alone. And on the record side, you never respond to somebody or you respond late. It's a violation. And the burden of proof, if you get sued, is on the government to show they did it correctly. And especially with no notice, it's hard to prove you did it right because notice really is kind of a CYA. As, and the same thing with, we'll talk about going into a closed session. Your motion is going to document whether you did this right or not. And your burden is to prove if somebody sues you. And it sounds fairly harsh that, gee, somebody gets sued you because you didn't give notice or FOIA affords a right for citizens once a year to say, I want notice of every meeting, subcommittee meeting. And if you miss them one time, boom, you have a violation. It's deemed. And you got to prove that you did it right. Well, it's a little hard when you forget to do that. And again, your staff is doing it, but who's going to be the name party is the body, you know, not the staff member, the body is. So if you can't prove you did it correctly, then the person who sued you probably in all likelihood you don't like too much anyway in the first place, now is entitled to recover their attorney's fees and costs for making you do what the law already requires you to do. My way of thinking, you know, FOIA suits can cost, <clears throat> excuse me, $1,500, $200,000. Does anybody in this room have budgets that have that kind of money in it? Right, and you're gonna pay somebody for making them do what the law already required you to do. It makes no sense to me. And further, if it's a willful knowing violation, I don't care if this is controversial, we don't want to talk about it in the public, then you can be fined up to $2,000 for one violation. And that is not voucherable back to the locality. You pay it as the, the bad member who doesn't. Okay, so enforcement, people 
don't generally sue government, but they can. It's a pretty easy, you don't need a lawyer to do it. It's a full service agency. We hand out FOIA petitions to everybody. We try to run interference and just try to get people to do the right thing on the government side because I don't like the people to have bad views of government because people elected, appointed, rank and file employees, we work really hard and to be professional and all that stuff. So I'm not really sure why we get one rap, but FOIA to me is our rehabilitation tool. You know, it builds trust, it puts things out there. So back to the rule of three. You know, when it's uh, local government day at the General Assembly, right? What are you doing in the car? Who's carpooling? Are three or more members of the body in the car? And what are you talking about? Old bus will be me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a right. high size crew, purple, black, and down council, and board supervisor. Right. So, right. And there you go. And what are y'all talking about? A little bit of everything, including business. Right. And so, and so you have, who thinks you're beeping at that moment? Right. Okay. And you are. And people are already going to assume they see it. But the one thing good about FOIA is notice cures everything. That's correct. If you just give notice, that's what this is about, giving notice. That we're traveling, and we're going to be talking about now, how can it be open to the public? That's the only thing. You have to let people, so you really have to restrain yourselves in that context. And private sector folks usually are not as nice as you all. You know, they throw cups at me when I, they were like, this is so impractical. I mean, in the, the private sector, we do this, we do that. And I'm like, you're not in Kansas. This is not private sector. This is public sector business. So the notice can't cure a confined space because then it's clearly not open to the public. So you just have to, um, or you have, you know, some of the things we do when you're like, you're touring, some facility or something like that. What do you do when it's a private company and they don't want the public trailing because your your government hat is firmly on your head and can never come off, right? When you're three or more of you, it's, it's, but sometimes it's not even your meeting. So the local chamber invites you. Why are they inviting you to their meeting? Because they like the clothes you wear? No, because you're the governing body. So this is what happens is three or more of you, that's why your clerks usually are like, who's going, you know, when you get invited, but you're carrying open meeting rules with you wherever you go. So a lot of times if you're doing a tour or the chamber invites you or some association invites you to come over, then we can fashion um, sort of a remedy for you and what even in the bus thing going to Richmond could be you have a meeting first a joint meeting of all the councils and say look this is General Assembly Day at the Capitol and this is the notice we're going to be going there and we're really going to try not to talk about this we're not going to use this as an opportunity to talk about public business you know and really be honorable about it same thing with the tour. You have sort of meet in the parking lot, tell them we're going to tour this private facility and you're not, and you have choice. You can either tell the private facility if they want something from you. You make a video of whatever it is that you're afraid of for the public to see and then you come to our public meeting or you have this sort of meeting in the parking lot that we're gonna tour, but we're not gonna use this as opportunity ask a million questions and conduct the business. And when we finish the tour, we're gonna to convene again and tell you what we saw. And that, and that way you sort of address the whole issue. The simplest thing is when you're, three of you are traveling or at parties or whatever, one thing that will stop um, the discussion of the public business immediately is one of you will go over at the other and go, okay, who's taking minutes? And I guarantee you, <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants to take minutes, you know? And that will shut everybody right up, say who's taking minutes? Because again, failure of minutes. Now, FOIA does say at the local government level, if like a subcommittee or whatever gathering is less than a majority of the body, you don't have to take minutes. 
but generally, you know, you think about that and that stops people. Okay, it's a small community. You go to the grocery store, you see two other members of council walk up over to on the produce section, and unless you're talking about produce, use that as an opportunity. Beep, beep, you're having a meeting. It can happen in church, three or more, and a discussion. Back in the day in the 70s, there was a song, whenever three or more gathered in the name, there is love. In Foya land where I live, <laughs> whenever three or more gathered in the name of public business, there is a meeting. Notice, openness, minutes. Okay, so this rule of three or more can get you inadvertently all the time. So, yeah, I yeah. Because, you know, when you talk with three or more, being a small town, we are in same organizations. If it wasn't for some of us, there would be organizations, right? You know, remember, so, you know, the best thing is, I guess, not to sit together, be very, very right. Right, and, and we have the same issue on the FOIA Council because a lot of members of the FOIA Council sit on the Virginia Coalition for Open Government Board. And the topics are pretty much the same. And so it's like, well, you know, if you keep the public trust, then you know, only two of you can really serve on the board at any one time. And there's ways. I mean, the Noah's Ark rule is not Aunt Maria's telling us how to get around FOIA. No, FOIA allows this. They're just saying, when it gets to a sufficient number. And the best buy-in I get for the rule of three or more is, it's not for me so much for the public's benefit, it's for the rest of the body's benefit, is that there's always a pesky minority. You know, bodies are you know political and not everybody plays nice, and nor, that's not the point to play nice necessarily, it's to be an adult, but you know. But that, that pesky minority can't mean without you, the rest of the body, knowing about it. And that's when I get the, oh, light on, oh, FOIA thing, not bad. You know, notice is good for us as well, okay? So be careful. Now, the only exception to the rule, of the Noah's Ark rule, two by two, you can meet on the telephone, you can meet in person, you can meet, I mean, have conversations via email, but be careful when you choose email, you're creating a public record that can be requested and probably in all likelihood, unless you're the mayor. There's an exception for the mayor on the record side of the equation that you don't have to release. I didn't know that. Yeah. I was At the local level, yeah. Well, what I do, uh, I told members of council, because sometimes members of council got mad at me because I'll correspond with the town office, and they're like, why do you tell the council this? And I'm like, well, everything I send the town manager, or sometimes I'll, and sometimes I'll send the uh, council president, who's one of the council, I'll always copy the clerk so it's public record. So if anybody ever tries to say, Billy, you're, you're trying to, and I'll never, I'll never send an email to two or more members of council. And if I do, which is very rare, I'll copy the clerk. She's told me she's been to conferences where she's required. That way somebody, you know. That's what we high. tell them. Clerks thank us. They're like, oh, thanks a lot, Maria. But that's the way to do it, is always CC your clerk. Yes. Because then they become the repository for the record. And somebody said, Billy, you're trying to, you're trying to have an impact on me. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm letting the clerk have it so the public can also see it. Right, exactly. And that's one of our suggestions in our, you know, email use and retention kind of thing is always CC the clerk, and that way the public record is, you know, resides at an employee level. And that way you don't have to search your emails in response to a employee request. But just be careful that emails are records, A, you are creating, and B, um, you know, the consequence of choice is that you're creating a public record because it relates to the transaction of public business. Just a, a quick question uh, about uh, the definition of a discussion. Uh, Mayor Wilkinson brought a good point. Uh, a few of us sit on our, our part of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, mm -hmm. and I don't think there's ever three members. There's usually two members of the council who are in the meeting. And part of the uh, part of what we do is we give a, a report of the town and just uh, right. let everyone know what's going on. There's no back and forth. It's okay. just right. what's discussion. You know, but yeah. You when I'm that? talking to myself, I'm not having. You know, there is no discussion going on. So discussion implies there's two, okay. and so that's why a lot more council can't be on the chain. Yeah, members of the 
the chamber. And so back to the example, you're going to another meeting that's not your meeting, but you sort of wear two hats. Or you, it could be you wear two hats or you don't wear two hats. Some citizen group has invited you. You're still dragging open meeting law with you wherever you go. So it's kind of like watching the weather channel about how lightning strikes. You know, there's all this static electricity and then it starts lining up. And then once it's grounded, you have lightning. So let's play that out in a public context. You're at some private group invited to council. Like you said, don't sit here. They say, well, here, we have a seat for you at the dives. Don't. Okay, because you have to give a notice. You know, I mean, the more you look like the body, then you have to be. So, you're, but you're there just to hear. Just to, you know, you're there really as a citizen. But remember, that government hat's not coming off your head. So, the way it works is there's, most local government attorneys tell you, if you walk in somewhere and see two others, one you go. Because then you can never, you know, you can't violate the law. But it doesn't have to be as that stringent is don't sit together. If they offer you a seat at a table together, don't take it unless you've given notice. But then again, if you've given notice, then there's going to have to be minutes. So this way you're in somebody else's meeting, but you're there and there's three of you. But now, okay, go ahead. Okay, I was wondering, like, the fire department invites the council, the chamber mm -hmm. invites the council, right? Yeah. So we, we just spread out? Right, you spread out and you... Yeah, but see, they have a lot of stuff that's brought up now is the fact that they, what, what right. we are as officials of them are going to do or what, what they want us to do or something like that. So you want us to have a public meeting. Right. Notice. Like what we did in our court tonight, even though I expect more people to watch right. here, we issued a notice for a continued meeting, which is wonderful and continue a notice standpoint. But right. luckily, I'm by myself. Right. So there are minutes being kept. Right. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I, but we're, I, we've always, our court is very good when now notify the public. Right. Notify the public. Because, exactly. Because it's like when I worked for the State Department, I worked in security, and we always did interviews with, you know, if you were in a foreign country and what you ever and in the background investigations because we just needed to know so nobody could blackmail you. So if somebody was like, oh, did you know? Yeah, we knew that. And that's the same thing about giving notice. There's no secretness and you deflate it. But back to the example, and that's troublesome because that's you're Same sitting way. at the fire department in close proximity uh -huh. and they've invited you because of your public- This was good. Right. This was good. We were just what two weeks ago, <laughs> right? And so, yeah. and so, and it's not like the public can really come to that. So then you have to restrain yourself, which is this: how you do it. Let me give you my reference to lightning striking. So you come there, but you're there to listen in a different kind of context. And so somebody says, Councilman X. Could you just tell us what the council's thinking about? Councilman X stands up and says, this. Councilman Y says, well, that's, I mean, let me just add a little detail because that's <laughs> general. Right. Councilman Z says, well, to be perfectly clear, you see what just happened? Three or more, and you just turned it into a meeting. Now, okay, I work for the General Assembly, and I say this with all due respect. Trying to tell an elected official to keep their mouth shut. <laughs> it's uphill. So that's why it's easier to keep your numbers down. Or in, in the example you use, it's the you know, fire department's dinner. You're sitting Christmas dinner, right celebration, right goodwill, no no one's really talking down business. And if they start asking, can you, you know, because they're gonna go there, and then you say to them, This is not the appropriate form to discuss the public business. And that, you know, that we can have this conversation in a different venue, but right now we're here for good cheer, and this is not a time to discuss public business because once you start, another member of council is going to start, and... <laughs> now, and I think also, we have a Christmas bank, we have Black Network, the entire council, the mayor invited, mm -hmm. and probably we should have four or five or ten. Mm -hmm. 
But I can also say that's the one bank where no one is saying, we're not recognized or speak or whatever, basically right. just watching the primary awards. But wouldn't it be better, always there on the side, clerks and have a notification? Sure. And it could, and I guess it'd be a uh, continued council meeting. Right. Possibly. Or the fact uh, that we're gonna the, Yeah, the fact that we're gonna be here and this is what we're gonna do. But when you give notice, then that entitles people to show up. It also means someone's gonna take with us. Right. Case. And the clerk's gonna be mad at you if they make Right, because the worst case scenario is it could be three of us having to be at the bar and you know, let's face it, when three of us get together, at some point in time normally you know, it's unlikely that something's not gonna come up about right. the last meeting or the next meeting. But and just be clear, it's three members of the same body. Right. So, you know, different Okay, let me ask you this. When, okay. when I was elected before I went into office, I wanted a chance for the council to have a dinner together. Right. And we checked with the, we invited our, it was at our house. Mm -hmm. We had all seven council and their spouses or significant others came. Our lawyer came, the newspaper, had by, he and his wife came. Bill Mason didn't make it from the radio station because the, the, the race wasn't over. And, 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 on, and on the invitation, I, I said, no, the only thing we talked about, when we all sat around the table, I asked, I wanted to get to know them, and it was something about, well, where were you born, you know, something about that, and, and I mean, to all that I know, and then we all went home, and then they went home, I stayed where I, I, I lived, but I, you know, I, I would love to do that again this year, but now that I am official official, because I've sworn it, I don't, I don't know, I think you can Absolutely. still do it, yes. but do the same thing. If this is not an opportunity to discuss, and I, I was very proud of the, I, you know, the, I was very proud of, it. and I even invited the mayor that that was that had elected not to run, you know, for right. and his wife to come and all, and they, you know, they declined. They had other things, but if I was proud, at least to my knowledge. Right. That, that they didn't, but I was wanting to know if that was all right. That's fine. I mean, because it requires all right. The right number and the right discussion. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have both, it's not a meeting. It's the right discussion, and you have to sort of restrain yourself because there's another euphemism we use for the bump into provision of FOIA that says nothing in FOIA prohibits, or now we've changed it to the definition because Senator Rump um, was something in Farm Bill where. Um, Tea Party group invited so supporters, like the yeah. and they didn't want to go, and they didn't really have the moxie to say, "Well, we declined your invitation." So they put it on the FOIA council, and that's okay. You can you can hit us all the time, right? But they told us we couldn't come because it would be a meeting under FOIA. It's not really what we said, right. but um, but the bump into provision says there is. Now it's a meeting is not. So a gathering of employees is never a meeting under FOIA because what would the notice be? I'm going to work today and I'm going to be doing my right. job, right? <laughs> but now also what's not a meeting because when you read the words, nothing in this chapter shall be construed to prohibit the gathering. It's like, well, what does that mean? Does that mean it's not a meeting or it means you can do it? I, you know, so let's just real straight up clear. It is not a meeting for any number of, of a deliberative body to gather at any function where no purpose in that function is to discuss the public business. And it wasn't prearranged to have a discussion of the public business. So that's social events. You know, an employee retires, you show up, but it's not, it says, wasn't prearranged for the discussion, and no purpose of that gathering was the discussion. So if you cross the line and then still have a discussion, you're now, the little exemption it gave you for social events, you just crossed out of it, because now you've turned it into discussion. And so there's, you know, it's, you just need to hear it and be mindful of where the lines are. And easier thing, you know, to try to tell elected officials, keep their mouth shut. Okay, good luck with that. So keep your numbers down. I'm just being truthful. I am extremely pragmatic. You know, this is not about gotcha. This is not about catching people. This is you doing what the law requires you to do because we're all benefited from that. Okay? And the 
only time the Noah's Ark rule doesn't apply is if two members happen to be a quorum of a subcommittee. So our committees and advice now, we have three member committees. And right. then we do public notification on all the meetings. Right. They're open to the public. The one, yeah. the one problem we've had, and this is the, the, I, I, I've had a problem with this, we, we, at one time we had a fracture council. We'd have three members of council in the committee meeting. And then other members of council would come and then they would start contributing to start bringing them out. And I said, look, you're welcome to come. But once you start talking, we got you, you become poor, it's a quorum. Right. And I said, it's also it's, it's somewhat disrespectful, not just the committee, but to the ones who, who are working maybe and can't come to the meeting. And I've had people, some members of council battle me. I've got a right to speak, I'm a citizen. I said, no, when you ran for office, you cross the line from being an ordinary citizen and you're right. You're carrying open government, that hat is screwed down on your head. Tell you, and we just wrote an opinion about that. Because and my attorney finally reprimanded and said, "Look, everybody, you want to come, come, but be quiet." And right. Everyone's following that. And that's kind of what you have to do because you've noticed it as a committee meeting, and so there's a couple issues. One, effective use of committees. Why have subcommittees, whatever you call it, if it's going to turn into a full council? Five or six people there. It's like my committee, general laws. We have 22 members. We have four standing subcommittees. To do get down into the weeds about it. A lot of committees, when the subcommittee reports up, um, a lot of committees take public comment again, and it's like, what is the point of having a subcommittee if you're just going to rehash it? But I also understand, and part of the opinion, is that this was, I think, in Culpeper. They had subcommittee meetings all in one evening, one afternoon. So everybody kind of showed up and waited for their turn. So everybody was at every subcommittee meeting of the council. And the same thing happened. They all just, was a free for all. They started talking and it's like, our opinion was, you just turned it into a council meeting for which no notice is given. Now, I don't know what a judge would do. You gave notice of a subcommittee meeting and you turned it into a council meeting and there's you can conduct business. You know, if a quorum's present, that's what, so you are exactly right. You, it's like, you can be there because I understand other members who are not committee members want, want to be there to hear the more detailed discussion, right. but they gotta, because they'll turn it into a council meeting unless you give notice that this is a council meeting and then what's, you know, what's the, the efficient operation of government, why create a subcommittee if it's going to be a committee of the whole? Right. You're wasting everybody's time to stay as a council meeting and just deal with it at the body. Okay? So we've addressed that issue as well. FOIA says nothing about agendas, except when you receive agenda materials, then a copy of that, except the exempt parts have to be out on the table for public inspection. The, the meeting subcommittee meeting we had yesterday, there was a, somebody from the Daily Press that wanted to say that your notice has to have an agenda and it has to have every element of a closed meeting in it. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, because we get calls all the time. We've seen the agenda and it says closed session, but it doesn't state the purpose. It's the agenda. Right. The motion was the purpose. The motion, that's a different thing. Oh, well, that was the proposal was we need to stack it up in there, in, in the notice, just in the notice. I don't think that's a great idea. Um, you know, that's why you go to the meetings and it reminds me of law school and tax costs. The right hand doesn't get you, then the left hand will. Same thing in FOIA. If you're not at the meeting, they can certainly get to the records, you know, and find out. And that's kind of the point. So now we've set up for the meeting, we've given notice, and I'm circling sort of <clears throat> parts of FOIA that need to change, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, the notice requirement. Again, your staff does that. But notice right now is still tapping a piece of paper up somewhere. In a prominent public location where notices are regularly published. I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. You tell me where that prominent public location is in Alexandria, Virginia. Or even in Richmond at the General Assembly. Where exactly is that notice place? The FOIA Council bought a glass bulletin board that's in the lobby of the GAB and everybody in the legislative agencies posts there. So we train people. 
But if notice is the point to beat the bushes, then putting something on a door, tacking it to a tree is a crazy idea. I mean, it's outdated. Plus, when you, if you have a website and you post notice on the website, but you don't post the physical notice, you're in violation of the law. Crazy. That needs to change. And so there's going to be a big bill in the 2017 session. If you talk about retirement, I'm going to see that thing through and I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so there's no requirement for agenda, but we encourage as a best practice that when you do give notice, you know, you include an agenda. It doesn't mean you're tied to the agenda because again, the need of government to function, the agenda stuff happens. You got to add stuff, you get bump stuff off, and people get all hot about that and think, no, they changed the agenda. That's okay. You know, that be, it's under control of the process. You know, you want efficiency in meetings as best you can make it. Um, and again, once you receive agenda materials, and you know, in the day we used to mail them, and now we just hit send. Once that send button, because the whole idea of you get the materials before it's written up in the newspaper about what you're gonna do before you get to see it. But a copy of the agenda materials, minus anything you're prepared for closed session, is available for public inspection. Um, we encourage people, let's see, I was last Friday in the town of Irvington on the Northern Neck in Kil um, Whitestone and Kilmorna. They have meetings and they don't even make the agenda, like have copies of the agenda for people to look at in the meeting. And it's, the law doesn't say, A, you have to have an agenda, but the public relations of it, okay, wait a minute. They get confused, they get frustrated. Exactly, let's get this straight. You've been elected to do the people's business, but the people don't get to see your order of business? Really? Does that make sense to anybody? I mean, and they just, and it wasn't because they wanted to be secretive, it just was like, well, why should they get a copy? Correct. And we encourage people with the gen materials, unless you're throwing some on the overhead or something like that, have extra copies. Because the buy-in you get, because when counsel or somebody says, well, if you look on page 13 of your handout, people want, unless it's visible, they want to, follow it. They want to find what page 13 says. And that's a good thing. You know, I mean, we're always on the receiving end of FOIA, and sometimes, you know, we wish it wasn't so, but the way it is, like I said, you know, to put a gun to anybody's head in this room and said you must serve. But there are things you can do that promote the goodwill and the good feeling, and just observing just human nature. So now we're having the meeting. You don't have to have public comment unless another law says you have to have a public hearing. But if you afford a public comment period, you do. And you can't say, okay, only the people that agree with us get to talk. You know, everybody gets to talk, you know, right? Um, or sometimes people bring placards to meetings. And I've had a place that said, oh, you can't bring that in there. You can't record this meeting. Uh, wrong. FOIA gives anybody the right to record any public meeting, to videotape it, audio tape it. But again, control over the proceeding, you can set up rules that say no microphone in the face, you know, no cam recorder right in my face. And you got it with the placards over there, could you please sit to the rear of the room so that people behind you, you don't block their view? And if it's a big thing that's gotten everybody riled up and everybody wants to say, you can limit how long they can speak if you afford the public comment. I mean, we do it in the General Assembly all the time. Is, you know, we can't be here till 2 a.m., so it's three minutes aside, and if you have, if you agree with the person in front of you, then just say that. Sure. And the thing that kind of gets me is that people require people to sign up or make some reservation to make public comment. 
I'm not sure where that's coming from. I mean, that's terrible. And then the school board that meets here on the second Thursday every month. You have to do it a week before. If you want to speak at the school board meeting, you must sign up by five o'clock the preceding Friday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, see, to me, that runs afoul. I mean, because the spirit, a, the spirit is bad. Just the, the spirit, spirit is bad. But plus, A, I think on the argument they can control to say, well, we need to know how long the meeting is going to last. But what if somebody, you're affording the opportunity to speak. So if you're affording the opportunity, somebody in the audience that didn't sign up still has a right to speak because you're affording the opportunity. But it just, it's unnecessarily. It's a hurdle. Right, and it makes it it gives a bad um, impression, and I like it since you brought up the school board because the governing bodies always point to the school board as see what they do. And my response to that is, if it's stinky when the school board does it, it's stinky when you do it too. You know that there's no real difference between that. All right, so the meeting, a lot of public relations going on. Have copies of the agenda. Have copies of the materials. You know how many people come, you know, and once I got, well, can we charge them for it? Yeah. You so could, it's, but it's, it's then, bonkers. aren't you busy during the meeting as the clerk and you have people making a FOIA request? You get so much more buy-in if you just give it to them. You know, it's government works best with the consent of the government. They know what's going on. You know, that's kind of, now we come into closed session time. You don't have to have a closed session, it just allows it. And FOIA is a recognition in that access against government to function that there are times government needs to play close to the best. And it's always in the public interest. Buying real estate, selling real estate, economic development. I did a study at the General Assembly years ago about economic development in my report I wrote was the subtitle was the second war between the states. And now it's not even between the states, it's locality to locality. Legal advice, litigation, lots of reasons you can go into a closed session. And the newspapers always carry a story about those balls went into closed session 37 times last year. Isn't that outrageous? If it was a lawful purpose, I don't care if they go in every day, twice a day. You know, I mean, it's it's the laws conferring the benefit that there's a public bargaining position. And the example I use, where I live in Henrico County, there's a vacant lot right next to me. And I want to buy it. If I had known about it, I would have bought it in the day. But if I knew, let's just pretend I do own it. If I knew Henrico County was looking for a 1.5 acres to put something on it and I knew they were looking at my parcel do you think the price would go up I could guarantee you. and then the, the newspaper story would be those bum board of supervisor members talked about the deals that what they were willing to pay for real estate and they paid more than they needed to so again closed session is about protecting you know, sometimes it's privacy when you're talking about doing the annual evaluation of the people that you appoint. Sometimes it's a negotiating posture, litigating posture, a bargaining position that you're protecting. And so again, under the kind of another yet rule of three of FOIA is that the closed meeting motion must state purpose, subject, and the code side. But by analogy where, you know, if it's a meeting, notice, open to the public, minutes, your staff does two out of three, the same thing with the closed meeting motion. The statute, 2.237.11, says purposes for which closed meetings may be held. The statute gives you two out of the three. You've got to come up with subject, and that's what's missing all the time. And your motion will document your violation. People think they read that entire little paragraph for economic development or buying or selling, and somehow you've magically arrived at subject? No. You just got a whole lot of purpose. Real estate, we're going to buy or sell real estate, or discussion in open session would have an adverse impact on our bargaining position. Okay, 
purpose is still real estate. We don't know what the subject is. And the subject part is kind of a disclosure. It's we're kicking you out of the room and you have a general knowledge, but we don't have to give you every detail, but we've got to give you enough to let you know generally what we're doing. Is um, personnel enough? Or is, if somebody wants to talk to you, if you say personnel, you can say the department, but they ain't Well, it, it kind of depends. With, you know, personnel is the purpose. 3711 is the code site. So the subject is the annual review of the executive, town manager. The annual review, you don't have to, and if you're going to call them in for, you know, for the disciplining, you don't really even have to say that because the personnel side of it is you can be a little more euphemistic, but there has to be a subject. And the school boards, they have the benefit because everybody's their employee. Where I come from, saying if it was disciplining the high school principal, well, there's like 400 high schools in the city of Alexandria, you're not giving anything away. But here, if you said disciplining the high school, bingo, bingo. So what you say is disciplining a school board employee would work. But now when you're talking about the appointed clerk, the, the manager, and the lawyer, is that who you guys appoint as a council for people that you directly appoint? So you can only go into closed session and talk about them, only them, because it's the opinion of the attorney general Look, in the meeting yesterday, look over an attorney's vote. We just ignore that because AG opinions are advisory, FOIA council opinions are advisory, and that's crazy because the locality has a responsibility financially and legally for all of their employees. But the position is exemptions from openness have to be narrowly construed. So the AG said, you can only go into closed session for personnel to talk about the people you have the ability to hire and fire. So what happens when the building official is behaving badly? Arguably, you can't go in because you don't hire or fire the building official. But what we suggest you do, it's a performance issue of the executive who did hire. Like, how, how come you don't have control over the building official? You need to buckle down. Conversely, the administrator always wants to FYI the council about things that are going on in the locality and want to do it in a closed session. It's like, no, you really, it's not disciplining you. It's not, and pick a different form. You could send them an email because the personnel records are exempt. They don't have to be released. But you don't, why do you need to do it in a meeting where now you're going to unnecessarily involve closed meetings that you may not have the authority for? So, you know, if you just want to FYI the council as the executive or the mayor, then pick a different place than a public meeting to do that if you don't want to talk about it publicly. Now, we've had a situation in Blackstone where our town manager has requested a closed session for personnel because mm -hmm. he wanted guidance. We had a garbage man that was in a tricky situation, basically charged with misdemeanor. He wanted guidance from council whether not to retain the garbage man okay. pre trial or to fire the garbage man. Okay. And he wanted council. Uh, well, see, is that a legit closed session? No, not really. Wow. We were on a conference call with our attorney, too. The right. chief's advising us to get right. ready to fire him. I was like, no, he's, he's not a convicted. See, I would more characterize that as a specific legal matter that, you know, can you, what are the consequences? Consultational legal counsel. Right. What is the, and it's specific legal matter on right. a specific, which is. She was present by the teleconference. Right. And she, that's, you know, when it's legal matter, the attorney has to be that's there. They can teleconference in. But to me, it's a specific legal matter of, do you have any legal liability if you fire this person? I mean, if they, you know, because in government, you just can't tell people you're gone, like you right. do in the private sector. So what happens if we do fire this guy? That's what we want to ask her. That's exactly what we ask her about. And see, but then I wouldn't do it under personnel because under the AG opinion, you didn't, you don't hire and fire. Well, we, we may have actually used it. We may have used the 
Pickhouse right. Station. Right. Pickhouse has a reason. Right. That would be the better. That would be the more. So are you saying that if, oh, okay, suppose police, uh -huh. you had a position open and it was interviewed and all, and, and your, your committee wants to come and recommend. Okay, do you appoint the police chief? The, the police chief had, had been hired. hired. Uh, yeah. And so there's a slot in the police department. Right, right. And, they, and, and it has been interviewed, mm -hmm. and the group that has interviewed, the town manager, the mayor, the police chief, and uh, what we personnel. had personnel, chairperson, has a recommendation. But then they, they so we're not supposed to go into closed, okay, that's something. No, and that's why I said pick a different form for that. Don't, you know, it's, I know you've got them all in the room and the need to, as the executive, to FYI about what's going on because you all want to keep in the loop. Don't use a public meeting to do that because you want to not have public this part. Let them send you an email. If it's all, just, it's really just about FYI, this is the person we're gonna recommend and this is why. Because the person, that, then it's a personnel record and if somebody asks for it, it's exempt from release. Okay, because I know Phil has called me on uh -huh. this and, and, and I, I have sent FYI to right. try to, you know, to provide information. Right. And I mean, I can do that. Sure. Not that I'm trying to influence anybody, right, right, which right, what right. is but taken, the, but I, I, you know. Well, when we reply all, that's okay, where Okay, okay, but. Right. Okay, that's where you gotta be careful. Right? That's and another lightning. Right. Copy that clerk, copy that clerk. That's why it's another lightning strike situation because, okay, we know emails are related to public business. Right. Our public records probably have to be released, even though there are 175 exemptions from release. But the question then is, can email become a meeting? And the answer is, oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that went to the Virginia Supreme Court. It was Fredericksburg in the early 90s. Fredericksburg was the place that was not doing FOIA very well. So what happened is the people that were voted out of the office, out of office, were suing the new city council, saying they were meeting by email to appoint library board members. No bad blood, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so what happened, and that's in the day when email, when you hit send, it was like minutes before it actually arrived. So I went down to the Supreme Court to listen to oral argument, because, you know, it's a FOIA case. And the justices were like, well, the facts were, one member opened it four hours after it was sent, Somebody did it the next day. So the justices were like, well, how's that different if you had this delivered by a, a you know, courier? Or you faxed it. I mean, that's not a meeting. Meeting, they looked at that rule of three in an informal assemblage. Assemblage, a French word, connoting simultaneousness. Now, did the Supreme Court tell us what? Is 15 minutes okay? No, simultaneous, which means the functional equivalent if you were all sitting in the same room. That's why our best practice is never, ever use reply to all. Because in the information age, we have this burning need to let everybody know what we're thinking the moment we're thinking. And it's okay for you to send, hey, I read this article, or something. Please do not reply to me and take other mayors send one to the clerk because in the meeting sense of emails the clerk can moderate the time for you right a, a lot of times i find like an issue article i'll say uh, and as a courtesy i might copy i'll send it to the clerk and copy my council president just mm -hmm. because a little bit of public relations there and you sure. know, building some relationships but i'll say please send it to the council at your discretion it's right. a pleasure i found this to be very interesting right and then everybody can reply to the clerk but again, back to the lightning strike. You don't know when people are checking their email. Because we're all in an age, we're not like living with our phones, are we? Mm, sometimes. <laughs> but sometimes yes, sometimes I'm no. Sorry. Right, I, you know? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So what happens? 
is innocuous enough. I read this article in the VML bulletin and I think it's really interesting and maybe we could talk about this at some time. Somebody ought right then, next person, replies all. I think, and you see, and then the third person, you've got a sign of functional equivalent if all of you, let's pretend you're all on the same body. It's a functional equivalent of a real-time discussion. So you violated two FOIA rules here. Not no you notice. violated the no law. Absolutely no notice. And local governing bodies, anything at the local level, planning commissions, school boards, can never meet by teleconference or other electronic we call it electronic communication means because when they put that in years ago, they were, they were anticipating something happening, you know, our phones, all these different things. Only big bad state can have meet by teleconference. Localities cannot. Because the idea is you live in the same place. Right. So you can just meet. Because the still the best bang for the public dollar is a face-to-face -face encounter because you get to know each other, you get to get the sense of who, where people lie on their positions. So you violated, you had an electronic communication meeting, that's violation number one, and your email just documented that violation. So there's no proving you did it right there. And number two is it's a meeting, there was no notice. They're probably minutes because the email is probably the minute, but it's, you know, there's no notice and it certainly wasn't open to the public. So you couldn't have noticed. It's like being in the car. We noticed it. Well, but it can't physically be open to the public. So be very careful because it's that same lightning strike. That's why we, best practice, never ever use reply to all because you sort of set that thing up. Use the clerk to moderate times of sending and have everybody respond to the clerk so the clerk can call people's ideas and how they feel and send that out and say, well, on that article, a lot of people thought it was a good thing to add to the agenda. And then you're clear. What about if you reply all the copy your clerk to make sure that that way if anybody wants that there's a repository, there's a... Well, on the record side, that's fine. That's but on the meeting is. side, okay. you're having the an, an so e right. right. Yeah, you're still having an email. Um, and you don't know because at the time you send it, you have no idea how many people are going to jump on at right. that moment. So it's best never, you know, sure, feel free to send things FYI, but just always include maybe a signature line. Please don't respond to me and don't use reply to all. I mean, there are a lot of localities that say you're not using email. You know, you're right. just not using it um, to do that. So. So back to the closed session when we talked about three elements. Quick, uh, quick yeah, question on sure. closed session. Uh, okay. Going back to uh, hiring and firing. Mm -hmm. If the, uh, the governing body, according to the charter, uh, if there's a member of the, uh, of the governing body who is no longer on the, uh, on the, uh, on the board, uh, whether they die or they resign or what have you, uh, and the governing body then appoints a new member, can they go into closed session to sure. discuss that? Because that's, they're appointing them. It's personnel. It, it, yeah, right. It's personnel appointment oh, or right. replacement. It's, 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 <laughs> right, it, absolutely, because you can appoint. Mm -hmm. It's just that at that point, let's just carry your example. You appoint a new, fill a vacancy. You had a discussion who should be, because you can even, you know, not give notice of where you're doing it so people don't see who's coming through the door. Um, so under personnel, certainly, when you're making appointments, you need to fill a vacancy. Now, let's carry it to the other side. If you've made the appointment, they're now serving. They've been sworn in, and their term of office has begun, or they're filling the vacancy term. And now you have closed session for some other reason. Um, legal advice about firing the garbage man. Somebody comes out of closed session, on council and goes right to the newspaper or goes to anybody and starts blabbing about what you talked about in closed session. The rest of the council's mad. They don't like it and I don't blame them because it, closed sessions are not confidential. 
closed sessions are about protecting the public position, so why would you talk about it? Because you're you're jeopardizing the public position. But somebody always does, and that's who the newspaper you can count on, the one male or female, and that's who they go find. Because now, then you have a situation the rest of the council's upset, and they want to have a closed session now to gripe at that blabbermouth member to stop it. No can do. Because while you might have appointed them, you don't have the authority unless it's in your charter to sanction them or reprimand them. They're elected to answer the people. Right, you gripe, you gripe in public. And so you've got a political problem. We talked about that a little earlier. You've got a political problem. You don't have a FOIA problem because they still have First Amendment rights to talk. But the whole idea is, what you learn at BML and VACO is, you know, you function as a body. You know, it's the body that does things. So it's, you know, it's not little individuals. And when I do training at BML and VACO conferences, I always get some new member that's like, you know, Maria, but I'm keeping it real. I challenge the chair all the time. And I question this all the time. And I said, were you here for the part that you operate as a body? Yeah, but you know, it's important to me to keep it real. I said, <laughs> okay, <Real enough. laughs> keeping it real. You heard the tale of Chicken Little, the sky's falling. At some point, you become so, you render yourself ineffective because everybody's like, la la. Even if you have a great idea, yep, nobody will you ever hear. They will shut you out. Really? Is that keeping it real? So what I suggest to you, if you really, keeping it real to you mean poking people in the eye at all times, then resign your position and go back into the being public and then keep it real for whoever you think your constituency is because that's not a good use of your time because you now have silenced your constituency because you lost your voice. You, have you voice. lost your voice. You lost your voice. You're not helping anybody. And so, and I'm, because of my unique position as a FOIA person, you know, step a little bit outside of FOIA about how to do the business of government and try to tell people, especially the new ones, wait a minute, that's not how that works. We had somebody in Southwest Virginia, before they were sworn in, they made a FOIA request, and so the, the attorney said, well, yeah, I mean, we wrote an opinion about this. It was in Washington County, in Abingdon. And it was like, no, you're a plain old citizen. And you don't have any greater right than any citizen, even when you're elected, even when you've been sworn in. And so he didn't like it. It's like, wait a minute, you're going to make me make a FOIA request? Well, yeah. I mean, by virtue of your position, you're going to get records anyway to be able to do your job. But what he wanted is everything in the previous chairman's computer downloaded and they wash out they, and they're like well that's a FOIA request and he's like how dare you treat me like an ordinary citizen <laughs> and I'm like is anybody hearing this what well you that's all you are you're no more you're no less you're an elected official but you haven't taken an office well I'll have your job I'll fire you you haven't been to the BML or Vago training yet. You operate as a body. You know, and this guy, and sure enough, in Vago conference for new members, they already, he'd already set himself apart. And I was there at 9 o'clock in the morning. They started a date. He had already expressed. And everybody was like, oh, yikes. And so he started to challenge me again about stuff like that. Like, that's the rule. What, I have to be, I said, what, part of doing your job, you're gonna get records. But if you want something over and above, you make a FOIA request just like the rest of us. That's how it works. You know, they're probably not gonna charge you because there's the political thing, they're your boss. Or, but, you know, it's still essentially a FOIA request. And so, yeah, you're not in charge. And that's the other discussion we had yesterday that relates to going in for personnel about the people that you're 
executive hires is the idea that you're legislators. You're the policy makers. As board members, you too, no, you're the day-to-day -day operators. But for the council members, you guys are more like the legislators. You're not the day-to-day -day operators. And so that's where that, from the AG, is that you don't hire and fire. You have the right under general local government law to be as council to operate the locality. But once you hire an executive, you have severed your ability to, you know, go in and get the building code guy and talk about him. But like I say, all local government attorneys are like, da 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 da. We don't we don't like that opinion, and we're not going to follow it. You know, and ask two lawyers, you're going to get two different opinions. So on closed session, the subject is always missing. And you gotta figure out, without giving away the store, some mention of a subject. Um, legal matter, in the example you raised about, you know, well, it's a legal matter concerning um, the liability of the county for discharge of an employee. That at least tells people, again, because the citizen side of us, we have to always put it in a context of, if you're at the school board, you're just a plain old citizen, and if the school board's not handing out agendas, or they're just saying we're going to close session for, you know, um, personnel. As a citizen, that's not particularly satisfying, especially when you know the law requires more. They're good here, but they'll do in the, in the closed sessions. When, this, when the school board meets here tomorrow night, they'll say we're in a closed session to consider 14 appointments, five resignations, three retirements. They're right. pretty good about that. That's right, and that's all the subject you need. And so then when you go into closed session, you know, you have to vote to go in. And when you go in, you have to stay on topic because that's about keeping the faith. Is this is the reason we're going in and we're gonna stay there. But as human beings, we, we, try. we try. you know, one thing okay. reminds us of something else. And that's why the lawyer in the room is usually like, back it up, back it up. Because when you come out, you have to certify that you, stand, you A, thought it was a righteous exemption, that you were legally allowed to close it, and two, you stayed on top of it. Now in closed session, you can take straw polls. You can vote. It just doesn't right. count because you have to get a sense of, do we have consensus? Yeah. Or do we not? So we can get out of closed session. But the vote doesn't count to put it into effect. That happens and has to over the years. It's very when I do a lot of times, I have one member of council that they're like, we can't do that. I said, no, I'm saying right now, if Councilman Jennings makes a motion, do what we discussed, and second, how does everybody feel about that? We have to vote in public. Right. And yeah, you can strongly let like, anybody. I said, you know, this is, this is totally legal. It's right. totally fine. Absolutely. And we've written that in any number of opinions. Straw polls and closed sessions are completely legal. It doesn't count. It doesn't it put matter. anything into effect. And it only you straw poll and don't make that motion, then nothing, nothing, nothing is in effect. That's how the law kind of, but you have to know, are you in agreement? You got the votes? Because ultimately it's about who's got the votes. And if you have the votes, then you're done. Um, now we had back to just a little discussion of the subject in um, Cape Charles over on the Eastern Shore. A lot, of, a lot of dissensions, a lot of debates on that. Water tap fees, but some of them like issues in Cape Charles are actually connected to some of the issues in Lifestyle. Oh, okay. With the developer and all that, and the old school and all right. that. Right, yeah, and that's exactly and right. The school. Yes. It was the school that everybody went to, yep. their grandparents, and their great. It has laid fallow for 20 years or more. It is not income producing property, it's a, a relatively poor community. They don't have enough to upkeep it, you know, so it's kind of boarded up. So they were having a closed meeting. Some developer made an unsolicited proposal to them. <laughs> and so the motion was, we're going in about real estate, buying or selling of real estate. And the subject is a um, discussion of an undisclosed I mean, an unsolicited proposal. They didn't mention the school. They just said real estate, property we own. 
And so, and the code section. So I got the call. Maria is the unsolicited um, proposal subject enough. And I said, well, it says a statement of purpose, a statement of subject. It, it doesn't quantify it like the open meeting motion to put things in effect that says, shall be a motion in open session that su shall substantially identify the subject matter. That tells you substantially identify. You gotta give the essence in that motion to put whatever in the closed session into effect. We don't have that in a statement of subject that substantially identifies the subject. It says a statement of subject. So at this point, that is a subject. It's not a great one, but you can't say it's in violation of law. There is one. Right. And the more they went down, so this developer was gonna turn this into low and moderate income housing. But everybody was just so tied to the building, they're like, no, we don't want to give people places to live. <laughs> you know, it was crazy. But the people are still protected because before they can park coming to that building, they have to have a public hearing to declare the surplus. Right. They have to have a public hearing to sell or dispose of. Exactly. And now it's income producing, it's off the city roll or the town rolls. And, you know, I mean, but people just, it's like my mom, you know, she moved to Richmond from Alexandria, my parents did a while ago. And she was just, you know, complains about her taxes or whatever. And I said, okay, mom, so what service do you want to give up? And she says, Marie, just, why do you have to be so technical? <laughs> I'm like, because I'm a lawyer. Because that's what your taxes do. It's money in, money out. We're not like ticks and we swell up with the money. We move it. That's right. And there's, it's effluent. It comes in and it goes right, you know, but. And that's just that whole idea of responsibility of citizenship to kind of pay attention to how things go. Just uh, going back to going into closed session, okay. the uh, specific subject matter, if it's legal advice for probable lit litigation, how specific do you need to be? Okay, those are two separate concepts. Sure. One is legal advice, specific legal matter. And we have a treatise that we wrote about what suffices as a specific legal matter. Because the AG has said, you know, you go in to talk about shall we renew this contract and or, you know, change the money. That's not a legal matter. That's not rendering legal advice. So it's where the lawyer is rendering an opinion. The litigation is a whole separate thing, which is current litigation or probable litigation. And probable litigation is threatened or it's a good faith belief by the body or by their counsel that litigation will ensue. So if somebody in every public meeting stands up, if you do that, I'm gonna sue you for that, that's not problem litigation. Right. Well, see, our counsel used to, before I became a mayor, we used to say possible litigation. I said, please change that to problem. Yeah. Because breathing is possible litigation. Right. And oh, you're being big. I said, no, I mean, no. Law, law is Everything's problem. possible. It's actual, threatened, or problem right. litigation. Right, exactly. Use the right terms. Them find it. But yeah, that it ha there has to be a good faith belief that you're going to sue somebody or somebody's going to sue you. So those are, you know, litigation has its own and it covers potential stuff as well. Right. But you have to identify the potential plaintiff or defendant? No. Okay. You don't have to give the style of the case. You can say, um, lit if it's litigation, it's litigation involving, you know, lit litigation over a park, litigation that the county is contemplating bringing. You don't have to say who, because again, in the legal world, just the other side knowing you're talking about in closed session gives them some sort of little boost. Mm -hmm. So you don't have, and in specific legal matters, you know, it's just legal liability of the council considering you know, specific, the, the subject is something a little bit more, but just don't read that whole paragraph and think that somehow you've got the subject, because all you have is a whole lot of purpose. Well, one of the most blatant examples I saw recently, and of course I, I'll be here tomorrow night as a reporter covering the school board. <laughs> we had a citizen from Blackstone from my town come up at that podium and ask the school board to adopt a resolution supporting a renovation of a building in Blackstone, the armory to be used in a distant learning center. I'm sitting in the audience as the mayor going, I love it, I hope they do it. They made, took no action, they did not respond. And I'm like, wow, 
uh, what was going to happen. Ten days later, the school board has produced a signed resolution with each school board member's signature endorsing the request that the citizen made. <laughs> now, I was, as a right. mayor of the town, I was like, I love it, that's great. But as a student of, a, a student of government, right. um, I was livid because, and so I even asked the clerk, and I haven't thrown her on the bus yet, and she said, well, they, well the superintendent found told one by one, the members, the, the school board members. And I'm like, that is an absolute illegal action by the school board. Right. It's pretty clear. It says, no secret or written ballots. I mean, right. the polling is the two, the Noah's Ark rule. One, it's to poll to ascertain a position. You can do it one on one. That's not constitutional action. You right. know, but yeah, you can't. Yeah, say, well, clerk, if you do it, then it doesn't count if we do it. Yeah, they, there's a signed resolution. Where is it that you vote? Where did you vote? Right. And voting has to occur in an open session. So, yeah. And two years ago, I was I was on vacation in Myrtle Beach, mm -hmm. and our little world, our little uh, Black Sun All Star team made the World Series. And of course, they had two weeks to raise money. They came to the town manager and said, "We need a donation." The town manager said, "I think we can give you a thousand dollars." He sent they sent an email phone call out. I'm in Myrtle Beach, and I'm like, "No, you cannot do this. You're gonna have a special council meeting." They give a thousand dollar check. Because six council members had replied by email one by one, oh, we, we support it. And finally, I had to get our town attorney to, to tell us two weeks after the fact that was illegal. Right. They could ratify it happy. later. And, you know, and I understand part of it is you come to an organization and the way things have been done, you think that it's natural to assume that this is the way it's been done, that that way is always complied with the law. And you're a new person, so you're not going to be, you know, right. poking people in the eye too much. So, but it's part of that. Oh, I'm now part of this body. Well, I assume that they do everything the way they're supposed to. So it's not like there's a bunch of bad actors, right. in my opinion. Right. And I just, you know, for the record, I just want to say that people do it because of ignorance. But that's why FOIA says when you get elected, you have to get a copy of the law and read it. And be familiar with it. Now, sure cure for insomnia. I think the better thing is call me or Alan and we'll come down and talk to you at a meeting. And also when you have some tension with the public there because they think FOIA means something entirely different. And I've done it in Leesburg lots of times where the public's invited and I just tell them how FOIA really works so that they hear it they hear it and everybody hears the same thing at the same time and it does a whole lot to just you know because my experience in the 15 years is there's a whole lot of perception about this law you know nobody actually picks up the book and oh, reads it right. you know so crazy people you know <laughs> but you know but that's one hour why you have a boy council that can help you out of those kinds of situations but yeah it's you know it's a 60 page law reading everything on do you have to know it like I do? No, but you know, part of being sworn is this is the law. These are not people people say, well, what are the FOIA guidelines say? These are not guidelines. This is state law and you can be sued. And just even before you get to do your public business, you got retention schedules, you got conflict of interest, when you can vote, when you can't, you got FOIA about how you set up a meeting and how you comport yourself during the meeting. I mean, the public sector is tough. You know, being an elected official is tough. You give up a lot, you know. You're here tonight. You're here most every night or somewhere doing something in the name of public service. You said something earlier, you were going to use the word ratify. One of the reasons, after the all-star donation was made, uh -huh. our clerk uh, at the next meeting, sought to ratify the vote. And I had the town attorney present, and of course, I, I didn't want to take the $1,000 check back. But the town attorney advised us that, you know, even though we were quote unquote trying to ratify after the fact, you cannot, that that matter, that the vote it, the, that the violation occurred. Already occurred. It occurred, and it doesn't cure your violation, you just kind of did it, okay, we're really sorry. Well, it hasn't happened since. Because FOIA doesn't, you know, 
it's not illegal, it's you violated the law and a violation of the law and somebody could have sued them on that basis even though they ratified it, it didn't make it that, no. it didn't cure it. Correct. It just meant, okay, we messed up before and we need to take official action now. But yeah, it, FOIA violations are like that. It's not people like, oh, that's illegal. Mm -hmm. No, it's not illegal, it's just a violation of FOIA. So once it happens, it stays happened, you know, right. and it's a two-year statute of limitations. So there could have been a lawsuit over people signing things to give money. But most of the time, the people who want to become plaintiffs, it's normally not based on the principal law. It's there on the loser side of the issue they didn't like, and they try to throw FOIA as vengeance. Right. Um, but like I tell our counsel, said, folks, if, when we wake up every day, mm -hmm. there are going to be people in this town that want to shoot at us. Don't hand them bullets. There you go. When you violate the FOIA, you hand them bullets. Just right. hand them bullets. Right. It's, it's true. It, it's completely true. And, you know, the thing with electronic meetings and that you can't do it, you know, and I hear, well, but that's not convenient. And my response to that is convenience never belongs to the government. Because it doesn't take very long for us to realize if we did any things that was just convenient for us, it would go down the tubes in a heartbeat. So this is a hard job, and it's not about our convenience. Now, the only other thing I want to talk about is there are times where you can have individual members where, as the body, you can never teleconference unless the governor declares the governor declares a state of emergency because it could be, you know, some huge contagion or whatever, and you can't meet, so you teleconference. But now look at it as individual members, and this is a FOIA Council recommendation, is that you have a regular meeting schedule set at the beginning of the year. And so now in August, council members are going to be in Disneyland, or they're going to be having surgery, and they're going to miss the meeting. Well, all they have to do, you can, there's a limitation under personal matters, as we call it. It's an emergency. It started out as an emergency. On the day of the meeting, you were planning to come, but something happened. Your car broke down, you got caught in the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. You're sick, your child's sick, you have a business emergency. You called in, they approved your participation because it's funny that it's always Phil that calls in that I got an emergency, so let the body bestow the privilege. So under that scenario, then it was expanded to personal matters, which is because not everybody serves in the locality where they work, especially borders. You know, people in Stafford work in the district, and coming down 95 is a crapshoot. You know, I was lucky today. <clears throat> Last Friday, I was not so lucky. But um, so the idea is, I'm stuck on 95. They can call in, and because we don't want to disenfranchise everybody they represent, that individual member can call into the meeting and be counted as present and participate fully. And where they are doesn't have to be open to the public because they're stuck on 95. Or they're in Disneyland. Or they're in the hospital. Um, so, but you can only do it two times for two meetings or 25% of the meetings, whichever is less. So we have bodies that only meet twice a year. And it's like a half a meeting. So we're gonna fix, somehow fix that too. But, so that's personal matter. So you can call in if you're going to miss a meeting. But then there's another category of temporary or, or, um, medical, temporary or permanent medical condition, which you don't have to get permission for. It doesn't. The nature of your, you know, I'm in the hospital, I'm having a you know, cardiac bypass. It doesn't have to be in the minutes, but the other personal matter has to say why, because you're present. Um, town of Leesburg, none of us when we drafted it conceived that it would be used this way. The member who wanted to call in was going to change the vote. So they denied him. Ooh, not good. <laughs> and we were like, oh, nobody, you know, we, that's, you know. That's bad. And so the newspapers, Form a new one, and they said we'll never do it again. But yet, we had a bill in the General Assembly that said, okay, there's no approval that you have to do. It, 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 the statute now reads, you have to first to 
be able to let people call in. I mean, the quorum clearly has to be in one place. But to let people call in, you have to adopt a policy that says strict adherence to the requirements of the law. We're not going to play politics. We're not going to do all these other things. So we've written the policy as a standard policy because we had to adopt one too because you have to have a policy in place. So it's more of an of right of members. And the policy could be, well, well, Phil's already done it twice. He can't phone in any more times. So there are ways, you know, again, government should be able to take advantage of technology. And what you have to weigh it against the open government, open meetings law. And so that's part of that balance, which is, yeah, we don't want to disenfranchise people because you're in Disneyland or you're having an operation or you're stuck on 95. Right. So under those circumstances, provided you have a policy in place, you can call in. Yeah, you can certainly call in and you actually participate in the entire yeah. meeting on phone. You can send an email with your position on a uh, on an issue to say your no. family span IDs and your adamantly opposed span IDs. Yeah. And, uh, I have that. I have that. Yeah. No, because <laughs> part of the rules are is that that member calling in has to be heard in the main meeting location and vice versa. And if transmission breaks down, you have to suspend until it's restored. Right. 